A couple of other things before we wrap up the uh, photo and video part. One uh, cool aspect of YouTube that we figured out how to utilize um, was the fact that you can link videos together through annotations, which are really easy to do. Once you upload your video to YouTube um, and it's online and it's um, processed and everything, you can add little notes and annotations and links in there. And you can actually link directly to other YouTube videos. So uh, one issue we are having is when we were looking at the analytics for our website, one of the biggest search terms that people use to get to our site were marine careers. Uh, particularly students looking for information on uh, different careers in the uh, marine science industries. And we had some older stuff up, but it wasn't really current, it wasn't great, but we knew a lot of people were going to that page and we're trying to figure out how to make it a little better. So we made a flow chart for an open house where people could flip and kind of go through and ask themselves different questions and see where they might end up in the marine career spectrum. So we took that flow chart and we were like, well, let's try this in video form. And it worked pretty well. Um, so what we have on YouTube is we have an intro video that's just about a minute long explaining uh, what it's like to have a marine career. And then it asks a series of questions. And at each question, we have links for yes or no. And when they click those, it takes them to another video or it takes them back where they can um, uh, answer another question. So I'll demonstrate that real quick. Whoops. Are you intrigued by the sea? Make a career out of it. Marine science offers an ocean of employment opportunities. Researchers, engineers, and others in the field address important environmental issues and raise awareness of our valuable natural resources. Many enjoy the fact that their jobs combine different interests such as biology, physics, and chemistry. Potential employers include state and federal governments, universities and colleges, and private companies. Let us help you navigate your way to a marine career. We're going to ask you some questions. Just follow the links to find out where your answers lead. So if someone's interested in doing the milita military, if they um, click on that, sorry, I messed up with the volume. Now I paused it. User error here. I need more coffee, sorry. <laughs> it, it takes them to the next one in the series, which gives them some options. And then they could start over if once they looked at the military careers that decided that wasn't for them. So it was just a different way. This can be embedded into different websites or shared with um, uh, like guidance counselors and career counselors um, to give folks a kind of way to explore and see all the different careers. We, we went all the way to artists and, and science writers and made sure we got all the creative fields in there. Um, everything we used in there was a uh, free resource. Uh, the images and the video clips were all in the public domain thanks to some of those different organizations. So it, it took just taking that um, kind of decision tree, figuring out the best images for each, and then just putting together these short videos, uploading them and linking them all together. But it can work for different types of stories or if you're talking um, about uh, 
a project that has several different steps and you make uh, different short stories at each part of the way. As you come to the next step, you can link it to the one before. So if people are interested, they can kind of work their way through the project as well when they come across it. So it's just another tool that's in YouTube. It's free to use, it's easy to use, and it's another way to think about how everything can kind of come together and work together. It's in YouTube, but um, it can be embedded into websites. So we have that first video embedded into our site so they can start exploring and still be within our website. Um, we did it all in annotations. Uh, one note is that YouTube has um, now added cards as another tool. And we're going to be switching it all over to the cards because the cards work on mobile devices where the annotations do not. Um, so we know looking at our website uh, analytics that we have a lot of folks that are visiting more and more on, on the phones and tablets. So we want to make sure uh, we can update it so it works on all the platforms. And that's all in the back end when you edit anything in YouTube where you can change you know, the keywords or the description. The annotations are right in there as its own kind of little tab. Um, we talked about live broadcasts and basically how easy it is. The last couple of conferences that um, I've helped on communications, we've just run it through um, the Facebook Live of great results. Um, the other cool thing I forgot to mention is when you go live, um, you can watch the screen. And you see when you're live, it gives you a nice little countdown before it, you hit go. It says three, two, one, live, you get the light. And then it um, actually shows you the number of people that are watching live. The uh, number next to the eyeball changes. And when people like or comment, it floats across the screen. So it was really neat at NMEA because we had a lot of people uh, tuning in from elsewhere. And all of a sudden, I saw these little hearts going across the screen. So I knew people were actually watching and engaging. Um, we had another person that was helping me with social media that was watching it on, uh, on her laptop to make sure everything looked smooth on the laptop. And if there are any comments, then she could reply to the comments. Um, this is back up. And there is a lag. So if um, something starts going wrong, you can kind of stop it. And you've got a couple seconds lag um, before it actually it shows up on the screen. And when you finish it, you can choose to save it or something horrendous happens, like somebody just runs in and starts screaming about climate change and, and throwing around profanities, um, you can choose not to archive it um, if there's something that you don't want kept on your Facebook page for a disruptive reason. Oh, sorry. That's my marker. OK, if I start wandering too far past that point, just let me know, because I don't want to be out of his shot. I, I put it there to keep myself corralled. <laughs> so I'll use the glasses. OK. And then we've already talked a little bit about the um, virtual reality in 360. Um, <coughs> and we'll do a little bit more on that just before the break. Um, do another example of kind of get back here. So when I was talking about the Bay to Bay teacher workshop that we did, where we went from Chesapeake Bay to Atlantic Ocean from step to step, um, this is what that looks like in the round me, where people could follow along. So this was our first stop along the way. Um, I'm standing over here, which means it's on the tripod. Um, so folks could look around, experience this place, and then use the portals to go into the next stop which was a, a native garden. We're going to go back in and add some little information bubbles about, um, about these different places. So it allows a kind of virtual exploration and following along of everything that we did. So you kind of just explore around, look at all we did, click through to the next portal, 
and be taken to the next place. Um, if you're in the Google Cardboard, um, it works pretty well when you're looking around. When one of these um, portals, which kind of looks like a map marker, comes up, if you stare at it for a couple seconds, it will automatically take you through to the next spot. Um, so you can go through and experience all, all the different landscapes. So that's just a quick idea of um, how we used it. Um, I was telling many of you last night how we like to end our teacher workshops at the local brewery. Um, we've got a good agreement with them where they do a tour where they talk about their conservation work. Um, they do a lot to uh, recycle the water and very water conscious. So they've set up a special tour for our workshops where they talk about the chemistry of brewing beer and their conservation efforts. And it links really well with our science teacher workshops. And we always have full workshops <laughs> because the last stop is at the brewery and everyone enjoys a nice tasting at the end. So if you're looking for a way to really pull people in, if you can find a great uh, connection with uh, science and local restaurant or, or brewery, um, that's been really successful for us. <laughs> and then with any of this um, photography and video work, um, the best thing to do is, uh, like I was saying earlier about reading and watching and dissecting things, is just look at really good photography and look at great footage and just get inspired by it. There's so many places online where you can just go escape for a few moments and great photos. Um, I've got a couple up here. The obvious is National Geographic. They always have lovely uh, photo albums up from all over the world on all different subjects. Um, they actually do some fun, um, they have a feature called Your Shot. If you get a really nice photo, you can submit it and you might end up in one of their photo galleries. So I like looking through those, just seeing what other regular people who aren't the professionals are doing and some of the really interesting things they're capturing. Another favorite is um, Boston Globe has one that's called The Big Picture. That's uh, much more news oriented, but it's also all around the world. Or if there's a really big event like the Olympics or um, a, a big news event, they'll do some really beautiful um, photojournalism albums on those events. Um, they, they usually do really nice seasonal ones too uh, around the world. And Time has uh, something similar called Lightbox. And then there's uh, some great online uh, educational resources um, available to learn how to use your camera better or, or learn how to use software. Um, Again, these Prezi links will be up so you can go through. Um, one of my favorite is called Creative Live. Um, they've got really, really nice, uh, well done workshops by professionals. And the best thing about them is the first time they um, view, they put them up, they uh, stream them for free. So um, I'm all about free. I'm on the <laughs> grad student budget and, and um, so I created an account there and I get all the notifications and when they're going to have a new class open up or a new speaker come in, they'll send out a no notification a few weeks ahead of time. You can RSVP and then you can tune in live and, and watch it throughout the day. They usually um, put it out at the time that they say and then they'll do a rerun right afterwards. So sometimes I've started work watching it in a little window at work and then I go home and I can put it on and I can catch some of the rest of it. Um, and th they're not very expensive either. If, uh, there's one that you're really interested in and you want access to it and we can rewind and watch again. Um, they're about like, I think they start around $49 and then you've got full access and then usually they've got resources that go along with them as well. Um, but the opportunity to kind of sample them first free is, is great. Another one is lynda.com, and that's L-Y-N-D-A. Um, that's great for learning different softwares. Uh, they, they also have things on photography and storytelling and have some um, great pieces there. But whenever um, I feel like I'm stuck in using a video program like Final Cut, or I know I'm going about things the hard way and there might be a better way to do it. Um, I, I jump into there. I, I pay a monthly subscription for that, but I've found it's well worth it. It's maybe $18, $19 a month. 
um, because their library is so vast. And I can, they have all their tutorials uh, broken up into little chapters and subchapters. So if I'm having an issue of a certain pro problem in the program, usually I go into there first, see if they've got the answer in, in one of their um, educational sessions. And if not, then I go to Google and, and start going through all the, the message boards. But they're, they're very well done and they've been around a long time. Um, the other good thing about that is if you're wanting to learn a new software um, or program, you can go in there, create, subscribe for a month or two, and then you can pause your subscription if you know you're going to be too busy to use it, and then you can start it back up anytime. So you can kind of turn it on and off as you need it, rather than totally shut down and create a new account, because um, I do that a lot too. Going on to the next section. Yeah. Can you ask what would be the recommended video or resolution to upload to YouTube or somewhere else in the internet to fix it? Or uh, if it was one of our mobiles would be good enough? Um, Usually anymore, what, whatever comes off your phone is going to be high quality enough, at, at least 720. Um, okay. But, um, it's a lot of times it will show it in whatever the best resolution for the connection is. So many times put up a beautiful HD video and then somebody's watching it on a bad connection and YouTube will bump it down to something really low just so it flows better on their screen. So I, I try to put it on as high def as I can just for somebody that might be on the iMac with a beautiful big screen can, can watch it in all its beautiful clarity. Um, but users have that option or sometimes um, if it's on automatic, YouTube will, will bump it down so you don't have total control over it. Um, actually, um, I was going to mention something about what I say anyway. Um, so talking about in uh, in different ways to share all this information, and we've talked a little bit about social sharing and the different platforms. Um, there's a lot out there, <laughs> and it's, it can be a little overwhelming. So we're just going to do a quick overview of some of the players. But first, I'm going to play this um, because it gives you kind of a nice overview of social media right now and attention spans.
So this gentleman, Equal Man, that pulls these together, he's due to put out another one uh, really soon. He actually comes to University of Delaware and, and talks about some of these statistics. But um, these statistics, statistics are out there in a, a lot of different ways, but one of the best ways to kind of keep on top of these digital trends and the changes, because everything changes very quickly in this world, um, is uh, Pew Research. Pew uh, Internet and Life, I think, is it's the, the section of their, uh, of their research center. Um, and I have the link in the resources to get to their page. Um, but periodically, they put out some really great articles talking about how fast video is growing, what demographics are using this versus that. Um, and they, they do really wide-ranging polls, and they have great data. Um, so there's a couple of different uh, resources to keep up on top of that. Um, Mashable.com is another good website for kind of keeping up on trends of what's happening with social media, what's coming out, what's going away, um, because it, that's changing a lot too. Um, a year ago, I would have been talking about Vine as a video uh, service, and that's gone. Um, so, uh, you know, Foursquare was big at one point with people checking into spots, and now you hardly hear about it. So it's constantly changing, constantly evolving. Um, it's a very uh, dynamic landscape. So it's uh, a lot of times, I think everyone just feels like they're running to catch up, and that's normal. So don't feel overwhelmed by it, because it's, um, it's just the state of things today. There's always something new around the corner, and usually it's the younger generations going out embracing it first, and then once we all get caught up with it, then, by, then they're on to the next new thing. But um, talk about some of the main players that I think most of us probably use. Um, how many people have a Facebook page for their work? A lot. How many people have one for themselves? Almost everybody, yeah. Uh, Twitter accounts, a lot of Twitter users. And what about YouTube? A little bit less on YouTube. Um, this is where we focused everything at first, uh, just to make it more manageable. Um, now, we still use these as our main platforms, but we've also added Instagram into the mix, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Um, Facebook used to be our main one, but we've kind of uh, aren't that hot on it anymore, largely because Facebook itself is trying to figure out how to make more and more money, and their uh, algorithms are changing, which means it's more pay to play now. Um, latest study I saw is if you run a page for a business or a group that you put out a post, maybe 10% of the folks that like your page might see it. Um, that number is continuously dropped. So because of that, we tend to be more repetitive with our posts than we used to be, um, and encouraging sharing more. Because on Facebook, when you put it out, maybe 10% of the people that like your page might see it. But if one of those people then shares it out, it, that gets you exposure exponentially. Because if that person has 500 friends, when they share it out to their friends, there's a whole set of new eyes that might see it that don't like your page. So anytime you can get things kind of shared out um, socially on Facebook, you're going to have much better success with a post than if you just post it and leave it. Um, it's also kind of changed what we focus on when we uh, post on Facebook. Uh, we try to do a lot more images of um, like a uh, taking pictures at events and then posting pictures and saying, tag yourself if, you're at the, if you were at this event. Because if somebody tags themselves, then again, all their friends see that picture and see the event and it's more exposure. So we're kind of getting more into, rather than just pushing our information out, like here's our new video, here's our new press release, uh, really trying to embrace the social side and getting people um, kind of having conversations about what we're putting out there and then using kind of the individuals and our, our followers to make that happen. Um, on Twitter, uh, Twitter's much more of kind of a conversation. It also, Twitter has a very, very short half-life, if you want to put it in chemical terms. I mean, you put a tweet out, it has 
People don't see it in the first 10 minutes. They're probably not going to see it unless they're looking for a specific hashtag or uh, have you in a, a special search column. So um, Facebook, we might post once, maybe twice a day. Uh, Twitter, we get out at least five or six times a day. Um, we found kind of early in the day and late in the day tend to be our best times, just looking at our analytic numbers. Um, I think people kind of check Twitter when they get to work, maybe a little bit at their lunch break, and then when they're kind of gearing down at the end of the day and just trying to unwind, it, it seems like um, people kind of get on there then. And we usually put one on around like 9 o'clock too. Um, there seems to be a we have a kind of end of the day spike. I think people check social before they go to bed or again as kind of when they unwind. Um, and then YouTube, um, we use YouTube to uh, host all of our videos because um, we can organize them into the playlists. We can, they're very shareable. We can embed them. Um, we also have subscribers that are, uh, we have about 200 subscribers now I think that are notified uh, when, our movie, uh, when our videos come out. Um, we have a consistent presence on there because we put out um, the 15 second science every weekend. So when we do the 15 second science, it always goes out on Instagram first um, on the Friday night and then I'll upload it to YouTube on uh, Saturday morning. And it also gets uh, shared out to Facebook Saturday morning and then we do a duplicate uh, Monday morning like in case you missed it and then I'll tweet it out several times a day too. So that makes sure we use the same content for all the different platforms, but we're posting at different times that work the best on the different platforms to try to maximize our exposure on all the different platforms. It makes it a little harder when, like for this grant work, that when we're doing the Spanish language ones, I now have to go gather analytics for all those different platforms um, because now I have uh, views on Instagram, I have views on YouTube and I have views on Facebook, but um, we do get a lot more eyes and shares in different dem demographics by doing it that way. Um, on the cool edition side, these are a couple others that we use. I mentioned Instagram. Um, we just like it and we've had really uh, good luck with it because fortunately a lot of what we do is really photogenic. and. Um, I know, particularly during this last year, I've seen a lot of uh, friends and colleagues kind of shift away from Facebook on Instagram because of all the political upheaval and yelling on Facebook. Nobody, everyone got so stressed out about it, nobody wanted to see those posts. And Instagram is kind of a safe place to go and just see nice pictures and videos and share with, uh, with your friends and others without having to deal with a lot of the uh, the drama you might see on Facebook. So um, we've had good success on that. And then Vimeo is a really, really nice video platform. Um, and Vimeo has, it's a much more mature platform than YouTube. Um, when you go onto Vimeo, you're not gonna see piano playing cats or <laughs> people doing weird stunts. Um, it, it tends to be more of a professional platform. And Vimeo has the, um, the benefit in that it's not blocked like YouTube is. So in the US, uh, sometimes government organizations, state organizations will block YouTube for state employees or uh, federal employees because they're watching piano playing cats instead of working. Um, <laughs> But unfortunately, that kind of goes into some of the classrooms and the educators too. So we found that uh, in a lot of schools where teachers could not access YouTube, they could access Vimeo. So that gives you another platform. Um, the playback also tends to be nicer on there. They, they do, uh, because they have so many filmmakers and artistic types, um, they really focus on the quality. Um, and you can also, if you have a video going out that you know that teachers might want to share offline or uh, one of your researchers wants to put into a presentation, you can also change the settings um, where they can download it as well. So you can make um, high quality video downloadable for others to use on Vimeo. What about Danny I'm not familiar with that one. I'm sorry. T Daily motion. Daily motion? Hmm? No, no. 
No? You're an American. Yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Can anyone else answer? Any experience? Positive, negative? If you're using something that works for you in your organization, then stick with what works, absolutely. As long as it's accessible to the people you're trying to reach. I mean, that's the key. Um, and uh, both Vimeo and YouTube work extremely well on mobile devices as well. Other options, we've got our LinkedIn, our professional networks. Um, Flickr is still around, although I start, I, every now and again you hear of some uh, uh, that it's dying or going away, but that's still a, a very popular way of sharing images. Some of our uh, federal agencies actually now use uh, Flickr photo streams to uh, have their public access um, images out there like uh, NOAA does. Um, so that's another way to, to access uh, imagery and share it. Um, Pinterest is one that a lot of educators use. We've delved into it here and there with kind of limited its success. Um, it's not something that I've had the time to really get into more, but I know a lot of um, folks on the education side use it to kind of organize ideas around themes if they're uh, teaching different subjects. It's a way, it's a, like a virtual bulletin board where you can pull together pictures and links all around a specific theme and easily share them with one another. So I know teachers use them for different lesson plans and subjects. Um, Tumblr is a microblogging uh, platform. Uh, Long-form blogs used to be a big deal, especially in science, but with attention spans and everything else, uh, microblogging became a term. Uh, Tumblr is a way to kind of do kind of shorter, quicker, uh, visually appealing uh, posts on that. Uh, Google Plus is still around, but that's also uh, kind of hacking in its death calls. Um, it has been very popular in science, and um, I was on there quite a bit, but it was one of those things where too many platforms, not enough time. Um, it, it was a great platform. I really liked how it was organized. I liked it better than Facebook, but for whatever reason, it just really didn't catch on with the main uh, stream folks. And then the bottom two, uh, the one with the red dot, is Periscope. That's one of the live streaming video services that I mentioned. And uh, Storify, which I'll talk about in just a moment, which is a great way to um, correlate social media. Um, so we talked about Facebook and kind of uh, how we use it now and how it's changed, as well as Twitter. Um, I mentioned in Twitter, we kind of use as more of a <coughs> conversational tool. Um, and there's a lot of folks in science that use it, and we've made some really good connections and had back and forths. Um, it's really uh, one of the most social of the social tools and for sharing information and for kind of having discussions back and forth. It's, um, I look at it as even uh, micro micro blogging in that you're limited to a certain number of characters, uh, like 140 characters. They keep expanding that. It used to be really tight and that you could only use 140 characters for uh, your picture, your link, and the text. And now they've expanded it so pictures don't count in, within that count. So when you've got an uh, image in there, you don't have to worry about losing those characters. Um, but uh, for Delaware Sea Grant and uh, National Marine Educators Association, we re really use it to uh, talk and kind of prop up our partners and support each other, as well as um, share a lot of resources and information that is important or useful to our followers. Um, we do about half and half on our posts. Uh, for NMEA, it's a little bit more 30% uh, and 70%, where 30% is related to our organization and our mission and things that we're doing. About 70% of it is um, shared resources and things that our educators would find useful, whether it's current events or upcoming webinars. Um, for Delaware Sea Grant, it's more half and half just because um, 
Sea Grant, we ha we're producing a lot more things. So we've got more things to share each month. Um, and when you retweet, uh, which is the RT, means retweet or share. Uh, now, on a lot of different ways that you use Twitter, it's called quoting. Um, it's a great way to share others' information with a little bit more information added. Uh, just a couple examples. Uh, Popular Science came out with this uh, article about the sheer strength of the coconut crab claws which was just, uh, had the whole kind of physics behind them, um, which was unreal. So that's something that's cool to share with our educators. Um, and a lot of times when it's an article that's got a, a really neat angle to it or some neat quotes, um, I'll just pull out a quote right from the, um, the article and use that as kind of the hook or the engaging tool to make people stop. And this one that said, you don't want to be around this crab when it gets grabby. So it was kind of a fun opening quote that they used that I could then use when sharing uh, just to pique interest. Um, another example, they put out a, uh, this Mind Shift is an educational site that put out a really great list of uh, books for young people that actually tell the stories of scientists' struggles um, to let them know that you know, science isn't a piece of cake and you don't always uh, reach the conclusion you thought you would and that it's a, you know, a, a twisted process. And again, I just pulled out a quote um, from that story. And uh, this has been one of our most shared uh, tweets that I've done in a long time because it's a great resource. And um, everyone knows the struggles of scientists. And it's a, also a good way if you've got a um, partner that's a really important, strong partner that has lots of great information, but they're not great on social media. Uh, retweets or quoted tweets are a great way to still share their information and put in the added value of the information that the people need. Um, our Delaware Fish and Wildlife group is fantastic, except the way they use Twitter is they post something on Facebook and they just automatically have Facebook push it onto Twitter, so they don't have someone actively tweeting. So a lot of times, you'll have this little information blurb that really doesn't tell you anything that's about something that's really important. So by retweeting or quoting it, I can pull out that information and say, you know, this is the full event that they're talking about. This is the deadline for it. Um, so people know what they're clicking on before they click on it. You see the other one, and it may not mean much, but by retweeting and quoting it, I can add that little extra value, get more eyes on their page, and uh, get some valuable information out to our followers who are really interested in local fisheries. So basically, I'm trying to figure out what's best for you. It's the most important thing. Is you do not have to do it all. Don't sit there with your head spinning right now thinking, oh my God, I don't know where to start. This is totally overwhelming. It's much, much, much better to do one thing and do it well than to spread yourself thin over a bunch of platforms and just feel like you're flailing and frustrated all the time. Um, the goal of social media, it's social. You want to encourage po um, participation and you want to um, share content that's important to the people that follow you and make yourself a resource uh, in the social sphere. Make yourself an expert in that uh, area. And that's what we've really done with Delaware Sea Grant is when we started, we were figuring out like anybody else like seven or eight years ago, but now we get specific questions or we actually get the governor sharing some of our information or asking questions that he then shares out because we've become that resource for fisheries and seafood related subjects uh, in our state. Um, so I mentioned kind of getting interest and extending the reach through your partner organizations. And when you first get started, you don't have to jump in the deep end and, and just, you know, start posting left and right. Um, the best way to get started is if you haven't done this before, is create a personal account. You don't have to do anything with it. You can just have your personal handle. You can keep the little egg on Twitter so you don't even have to put your face up there. And just go out there and, and look at what everyone else is doing. I, I call it lurking. And it's, it's how you learn. Um, just get, 
pick like five community organizations that you work closely with or other organizations in other states or countries that do similar work and see how they use it and see what type of engagement and conversations that they're having and start modeling what you do on, on them because they've already been out there and they've had the experience and they've already had time to make the mistakes. Um, and then once you feel comfortable with how everything works and how you share things and how you retweet and kind of learn from your feed, then start experimenting. You can do it on your personal account or then you can uh, you know, get onto your organizational account and just kind of wade in the shallow end, do a couple here and there, see what resonates and kind of uh, build on that. And that's the same across all the platforms. Um, just because there's these 20 things out there, um, you do not have to be on all of them. The only ca caveat to that I'll say is that um, if branding is particularly important to your organization, um, then when new things come out, I usually grab the username as soon as I hear about something because across all platforms, we are DEC grant. And um, for branding purposes, whenever we put out marketing materials, um, everything from our website to all of our social media handles on everything, we're DEC grant all along. So it makes it really easy to say, if you're looking for us, just look for DEC grant because um, that's where you can find us on everywhere. So if you've got uh, something that works for you, um, when I came on, unfortunately, most of several of National Marine Educators Association, instead of being NMEA, it was NATL Marine Ed, but they already had that kind of foothold in there. So we switched everything, so it was the same thing. It's not as memorable as the NMEA, um, but it's consistent across, which is um, important, um, particularly if you're working with a publications office or a communications office where they, they want everything nice and simplified. So um, just by grabbing a handle or account on the, uh, on the social platform, you don't have to use it, but you've made that land grab um, in case you decide to use it down the road. <coughs> And as I mentioned yesterday, um, I think the most important thing on, on social media is not to post for post's sake. I said usually, you know, maybe we do six tweets a day. That's not every day. Sometimes we do three if, if it's slow and there's not much information going out. Anytime around the holidays, um, it can be kind of dead on the information scene. And we really have to dig deep to find, a, you know, Christmas coral. Or, or something that's, you know, uh, we, we can link to what's going on. But everything that we put out, we're able to uh, link back to what we're doing. And it's kind of hard to see on the bottom, but this is just a snapshot of our Instagram page to give you an idea of the kind of variety of um, stuff that we post. We've got everything from a, um, a little comb jelly video is in the top left where when we were doing a trawl, we brought up a bunch of comb jellies and it was um, put on quite a little light show. So we just uh, put it in a little uh, container and showed how uh, it lights up in that, in that beautiful way, linked it back to some of the zooplankton research that uh, one of our researchers does. We've got our 15 second science. Um, and you can tell between them when we've got the three logos on there, it means it's part of our CW deep biosphere work because um, we're funded also by CW and NSF. If it's just a C grant, it's one of our regular episodes and we kind of switch back and forth between those. Um, we've got our wind turbine. It was really cranking out power on a, a windy day. Able will link that back to our alternative energy research. We've got uh, folks looking at fantastic glowing things. Um, cypress knees in the swamp and it's hard to see on this middle one but um, this was during the middle of the Pokemon Go craze when Pokemon Go first came out uh, people were all over that um, so we just drove around campus real quick to see if there were any pokey stops on there that might bring people to campus and they f we found that they created one around our educational display on our wind turbine um, so our wind turbine was a place where people could uh, gain pokeballs. So we highlighted that 
Come see our great turbine. Here's where you can see how much power it's generating. While you're grabbing your Pokeballs, learn more here. <laughs> and the other thing we found, um, it's not on here, I should have put a screenshot, was Chris, our education specialist, was with me. And we found one of the Pokemon characters in our uh, marine area where the boats are. And it was this funny looking little critter with, it looked like crazy hair. And I'm like, I don't know what this was. So I Googled it real quick. And it was inv actually an invasive weed. <laughs> so I was able to get, uh, you can take pictures within the uh, Pokemon Go game where I got Chris kind of holding on to the weed in the picture. And this virtual thing that people were going to come capture. And we could link it totally to our native plant garden and how we keep invasive plants off campus. So it's a fun thing that people might be looking for on Instagram where it's not your usual audience, but if there's a way you can draw them into campus and uh, maybe get them to read a few lines on that turbine or actually look up and realize that that huge two megawatt turbine is up there, um, if they can get out of their phones, then it's an opportunity. So we try to jump on those opportunities when we can just to uh, expand our audience and, uh, and recognition of what we are. Uh, so speaking about uh, social and sharing, uh, we've got the hashtags, uh, which uh, were touched on yesterday. Um, hashtags are a great way to highlight kind of the main subject of a tweet or a picture on Instagram, and in that many people will search out uh, hashtags looking for information on specific things, uh, whether it's hashtag marine biology, hashtag climate change, um, that one can be kind of interesting because climate deniers will search out climate change and then go troll posts. Um, so you've got people looking at it for good and nefarious reasons. But if you've got something that'd be interest of folks that are interested in particular topics, it's good to put a hashtag in front of a term <coughs> so it'll show up in those type of searches. Um, it, it's great, but you don't want to do it too much because um, then it becomes, uh, if you hashtag every other word, it's really hard to read anything <laughs> because it, it's full of those little um, crosses. So this is a just a little bit on uh, Jimmy Fallon because I figured it's after lunch and you guys may need to wake up a bit um, on using hashtags. Hey, Justin, what's up? Not much, Jimmy. Hashtag chilling. What's up with you? Been busy working. Hashtag rise and grind. Hashtag is it Friday yet? <laughs> hey, check it out. I brought you some cookies. Hashtag homemade, hashtag oatmeal raisin, hashtag show me the cookie. <laughs> Sweet. Hashtag don't mind if I don't. Pretty good. Hashtag getting my cookie on. Hashtag I'm the real cookie monster. Hashtag no, 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 no. Delicious, right? Hashtag I did it all for the cookie. Hashtag LOL, 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 Hashtag classic. By the way, did you catch last week's episode of Duck Dynasty? Hashtag quack quack. No, lately I've mostly been watching Netflix. Hashtag orange is the new black. Oh, nice. I've been watching a lot of Barney the Dinosaur. Hashtag purple is the new black. Hashtag I love you, you love me, we're a happy family. Hashtag I'm 38. Hashtag dinosaurs. Hashtag let me go extinct. Hashtag meteor. Hashtag ice age. Hashtag speaking of ice age, I just watched ice age on demand the other day. Hashtag funny. Hashtag Ray Romano. Hashtag Debra. Debra. Hey, by the way, Halloween's only like a month away. I know. I mean, do you know where you're going to be at? Hashtag life decisions, hashtag sexy ghost. I think I'm going to go as a ninja turtle. Hashtag gotta be Raphael. Hashtag Leonardo sucks. Hashtag the turtle, not the Italian Renaissance painter. Hashtag Mona Lisa. Hashtag, is she smiling? Hashtag, speaking of smiling, I just saw my dentist. Hashtag bling. Hashtag dental care. Hashtag cavity free. Hashtag, that's how we do. Hashtag, we go hard. Hashtag, we can't stop. Hashtag, we won't stop. Hashtag, we run this. Hashtag, true plays for life. Hashtag, is it worth it? Or let me work. Get. Hashtag put my thing down, flip it, then reverse it. Hashtag it's your permanent Hashtag it's your Hey guys. Yeah, Quest? What's up? Hashtag shut the f up. <laughs> So if you find yourself doing a social post and you find a whole lot of hashtags in there, just think about those two and their conversation <laughs> and maybe cut it back about 50%. Um, they're a great tool, but they can be annoying when overused. So when you're writing, just think about kind of the main subject of your sentence, and that should be your hashtag. Or if it's related to uh, 
uh, our conference over the last two days, um, then absolutely it gets the calm ocean hashtag so everyone else can find it easily. Um, also allows people that um, are using uh, hashtag columns. Like I, I set up a column that had all the tweets from Calm Ocean in it so I could see everything come through as people posted it. So it's a, another search option. Um, Twitter, uh, I, I use fewer on Instagram. I use a lot more, but what I do is I do the original post with a, a few hashtags that explains everything that's going on, making the connections. And then in the first comment underneath the picture or video after I post it, I'll put a lot of hashtags in there on all the various um, maybe science terms it's related to because then that doesn't jumble up the, uh, the caption. Um, usually now on Instagram, you, you don't even see that first. It, it's hidden uh, with one of their new updates. But hashtags are also a fun way to see what's trending, uh, both on Twitter and Instagram. Um, there are ways that you can check to see kind of the hot topic that people are talking about. Usually it's something that's either political or in the news if there's been a, you know, a plane crash or accident. But there can also be some really fun ones that you can jump on. And uh, this was one that we jumped on um, shortly after Jurassic World was released. It was uh, one of the dinosaurs back to life in a theme park movies. I did not actually see the movie. However, I could not escape the Jurassic Zookeeper hashtag on Instagram because suddenly all my friends that work in aquariums and zoos were posting these pictures of them in this strange pose with whatever animal they take care of. <laughs> and so there's a scene in the movie, I've since seen a clip, where Chris Pratt as the main actor and a bunch of, I think they're velociraptors, he controls them because, you know, he, he's got this control over them and he just goes like that and, uh, and the raptors are all, you know, under control. So we saw this happening. I talked to Chris and uh, so we jump in the car and we head to the beach and we're like, all right, Jurassic Zookeeper, what are we doing? He's like, well, horseshoe crabs, like what else can we do? We can't really, you know, get the, the birds rounded up or anything. So fortunately it was near like the spawning time, so there are a lot of horse cr horseshoe crabs around. Um, full disclosure, most of them in this picture were deceased. Um, we collected them, we spritzed some water on them to make them look fresh. <laughs> but we got our Jurassic Zookeeper pose with our horseshoe crabs. Live ones were returned right back to the water. We actually saved a few because they had been flipped over the night before and were still kind of struggling. Um, so we felt good about that. But then we were able to jump on that, again, link it back to the work and the research we do. Uh, horseshoe crabs, Atlantic horseshoe crab, we've got the largest breeding population in the world in the Delaware Bay. Um, we've got some researchers working on uh, alternative baits that uh, um, fishermen can use instead of using horseshoe crabs as uh, baits for like whelk pots and conchs. So we can link all that back to kind of the education, the outreach we're doing while jumping on um, kind of a fun trend and again getting some audience that might be scooting through there. And we further branded it by putting on, um, we made sure he had on the Delaware Coast Day t-shirt. <laughs> so we did a little marketing in there too. <laughs> he now has that handy in the car. Um, so if we know we're going to do something fun like that, we always make sure he has a t-shirt on that says University of Delaware, Delaware Sea Grant, just to add that little marketing uh, punch. Um, as we talked about before, thinking about images are key. Uh, say a picture's worth a thousand words in social media. I like to say you save a thousand words with a picture. Um, when you're limited on space and characters, um, having that picture can really tell part of the story that you don't have to use words to tell. And online, a photo really uh, drives engagement. Um, especially, um, these are some examples of Twitter feeds on uh, different devices. And it just shows you how much uh, an image helps you uh, stand out in a sea of tweets. Um, again, people that uh, follow you on Twitter, you've got maybe five to ten minutes before they, you don't even enter their feed because they're just scrolling over the top part. So anything you can do to get more attention is great. Um, just to point out the three examples here, this is a tweet deck. 
that's Twitter in the web browser, and that's Twitter on um, phone app, to just give you an idea. But you can see when you're looking um, on the big tweet deck, uh, what do you see first? The, the polar bear, the map, the, the big graphic things. That catches your eye, and when you're scrolling through a whole lot of information, anything that can kind of grab your eye and, and give you that little second to maybe look more at that tweet um, is, is a huge plus. Uh, another thing you can do on Twitter now is make an animated, um, uh, some say GIF, some say GIF. It's another one of those arguments that people get into. Um, but you, there are resources online. I think I um, have a link in the, in the resources doc, I'll double check, where you can make a little animated GIF really easily from your YouTube video. And um, so it will have a couple frames from your video. So you can choose something like uh, maybe a fish swimming up or um, somebody pulling something out. Just a, a little action in that animated GIF that will show up and having that little, the image and the motion really gets attention in a feed. Um, and it's really simple to do. Uh, one of the websites I use, I just go to, I copy and paste the uh, YouTube link in there. It lets me pick exactly what section of the video I want, and then I download it, and then I've got that GIF to use um, in many different places. And again, in these other two, you've got the, you know, the bright graphic. Um, when you've got a really beautiful graph or uh, visualization, that's a place where it can really stand out. And then cute critters, cr cute critters whenever you can get them, are always helpful. Um, this is an example of a very hastily done graphic that um, I'm not thrilled with, but I'm showing you because it was so successful. Uh, at the last second, we realized it was National Dolphin Day. Um, I now am subscribed to a calendar that tells me all the days of each day. So I, I can tell when there's you know, International Penguin Day coming up or it's Cephalopod Week, um, where we can link some of our, our work to um, this, these social media posts around these things. But I found out kind of later it's National Dolphin Day, and usually what we used to do uh, on NMEA was just link or put out fun facts all day, um, just like every hour put out a different fact. Um, and what we decided to try this year instead was to pull all those facts together, put a, a couple quick graphics, outlines of the critters we were talking about, and just share it as an image rather than text uh, updates. And it went crazy. Um, it was much more shared than anything else we had done up to that point, uh, where we had 16,000 people reached because people saw it, saw some cool facts, and then they shared it, and it just snowballed. Um, we had 638 likes, 582 of those were on shares that other people had made to, to their networks and, and folks. Um, we've reached over 16,000, and we had over 200 shares on that. So um, once I saw that, I was kind of embarrassed by the quality of the graphic, but I'm still <laughs> showing it because it's an example. Since then, we make our graphics much prettier and less hasty. Um, and we also learned for these things um, that National Dolphin Day is going to happen again next year. So just put National Dolphin Day on it. Don't put the date on it. And then next year, you already have it made to share. And then uh, one thing I was going to talk about with kind of the um, work smarter, not harder. <laughs> because um, I'm sure many of you are like me. You might be the one person or a team of two where you're doing a little bit of everything. And I call myself the one woman band because I'm taking pictures, I'm taking video, I'm keeping an eye on the social media, and I'm you know, playing the tambourines and drum and trying to do everything at once. And um, so anytime I can create something new and then use it again, it makes me much smarter than sticking the date on it. So um, now I have to go back and take out that date. So, when you're doing things like those graphics or creating some, some pieces that you want to be engaging and shareable, um, take five minutes ahead of time and think across the platforms and how it can be used in different ways. 
uh, and it can be kind of shareable and evergreen and that you can use it again. It's not just one and done. Um, we got smart after uh, that with the, um, with the Dolphin Day um, and we decided for Valentine's Day uh, we'd do a bunch of fun facts with some just real simple pictures, again for use pictures, um, with the hashtag o Ocean Love. And I uh, got some other people to use it too so we could share their content and kind of do the back and forth. Um, and by using Ocean Love and doing the facts, we could actually start it the week of Valentine's Day rather than just on that day. So we had a whole series of these that we put out. Um, they look great on Twitter. They look great on Facebook. They were very shareable. We had 83 shares on this one. Um, and there were fun things that people were actually learning from them as well. Uh, then these types of things where we don't do much with Pinterest, um, we still can use it very quickly. We set up a, a board of all of these fun facts and, um, and shared it for Valentine's Day and then we had a lot of teachers pull things from this. So if you have a platform that you don't use very often that you like to at least be somewhat active on, um, that's, this is how we use Pinterest basically. Whenever we have um, some great shareable graphics, we'll make a, a subject board on it that people then can discover and use. Um, and again, this is just showing we also did Endangered Species Day. Um, by this point, we also decided that we were having all these shares. We should brand it so people knew where it originated from. So you can see each step. On the first one, we had the date. We shouldn't have the date. On the next one, we had the great hashtag, but we didn't have our logo. So then we were like, oh, all these people are sharing it, but you know, when people share it, they don't say this came from da 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 da. So for our Endangered Species Day, we got it all together. We got the hashtag. We got our, our uh, logo on there so people know where it originated from. And then um, we also made the graphics so we could shift them slightly for square format for Instagram. At that time, Instagram still uh, constrained you to the square. Now you can do <coughs> wider pictures on Instagram. So that's another example of how social is always changing. And uh, just another reminder that the um, the back ends of these platforms are really, really helpful in figuring out what works, what doesn't work. This just shows uh, the back end of our Facebook page um, around some of our 15 second videos um, where you can see uh, basically the amount of engagement, the amount of likes, the amount of shares. Uh, it ranks them in the most popular to least popular so you can see kind of what's resonating. and um, YouTube uh, does the same on the other side. Um, and YouTube is just fantastic on the video, as I mentioned yesterday, where you can get into their analytics, play your video, and actually watch the attention span and where people drop off. Um, it's an absolutely great tool. Um, they also keep track of your average attention span. Um, we used to, with our CTALK videos and general videos, we used to be around 55% which is pretty decent, 55% would actually watch uh, the majority of the video, but with a 15 second science and really breaking it down to the shorter um, segments, are, uh, that number has gone way up. And we're seeing that most people are watching to the very end. It seems like that's a good amount of time and once you start getting between 15 and 30 is when uh, that goldfish thing, I guess, the goldfish is still watching, but the person is gone. <laughs> um, talk about Storify really quick. We're going until three for this. Okay. Um, do, does anyone here use Storify at all? A couple people. Um, Storify is <laughs> another great tool, um, especially if you have too much on your plate to be the social media person for an event or um, something that's happening around a particular subject in your area. It's a way for you to um, curate social posts without having to, um, to make any of your own. Uh, we use it in a couple different ways. 
but basically you're using the social community to become the storytellers. It's, once again, free platform, easy to use, um, and you can uh, take these stories that you pulled together through Storify and you can send people to the link or you can actually embed it into your website as part of your website. Um, I'll just log into it real quickly to show how easy it is to use. Um, so at Sea Grant, we use um, Storify for our big uh, Delaware Coast Day. We have each uh, year. Whoops. All right. Try that. Um, and we put out each year, we use, um, there we go. Uh, we use the same hashtag every year. We have this big open house for Sunday of October. Everybody knows uh, this event's happening. And we use the hashtag DE Coast Day uh, around that and all the promotional materials. Um, so in that, we use it as uh, a way to curate uh, social media around an event. On, um, for NMEA, I'm having problems with this. Ah. Can I see on here better? There we go. Ah. There we go. Um, so for NMEA, I uh, keep a running board of jobs and professional development opportunities in marine aquatic education. I pull from several different listservs, and a lot of people send them directly to me. So this is actually a Storify that's embedded within our site. Um, it looks like part of our website. And you may have seen a Storify before. Um, a lot of news organizations use it, particularly uh, in the U.S., the Weather Channel uses it around like a big storm event or a hurricane. They pull together people's tweets and pictures from the scene, and they put it in their website as a user content. Um, on here, um, it lets me put in links to the jobs and quick descriptions about each one. And I curate them all so the newest is always on the top. So anyone that checks back here can see the newest content at the top of the page and scroll down to whatever they saw last and then uh, check back later. But I do this all in um, on the Storify page. Hi, this keyboard's different than mine. <laughs> ah. Okay, notes. I don't know why. It's not letting me log in. There we go. So just to show you how easy it is to do it, if I wanted to pull together a quick Storify on uh, the conference we were just at, um, this is really as easy as it is. You just put in a headline, uh, quick description, and then you can search all these different social platforms for related content. So I can click on the Twitter tab here. I can search for the hashtag. And it will show me, hey, look, there I am. <laughs> Um, there I am again. It will show you all the content that's been tagged in reverse chronological order. 
And to curate it, all you have to do is click and drag it in. And then I can go down, I can click and drag the next one in. And then you can drag these in any order you want. You can click in here and add a subtitle if you want. And then when you're done, you just hit publish. And it's now live, so you can share the doc. And here's everybody who I just pulled into the story. So I can then notify them that I just quoted them in our Storify. So this is another great social angle because if I click on all those, I click on myself, and if I click on notify, then National Marine Organ NMEA's Twitter account will send out a tweet saying, hey, these three usernames, you've just been qu quoted in the Storify. <laughs> Here's the link. And a lot of times people then share that out and say, hey, they used what I had. Um, and it works on uh, several different platforms. So this is what it looks like on the user side. And you can click down and go through. Simple, very, very easy. You can go back and edit it at any time. So what I do for the uh, Delaware Coast Day is I start it usually a week before the event. And we do some of our, we're getting ready, this is what's happening, the tents are going up, and people start getting excited, can't wait for Coast Day, and we pull their content in. I do it the reverse chronological order, so whenever people come back, they always see the newest stuff on top. I'll probably like update it once a day in the days leading up to it. And then on the day of, I'll usually go in and update once an hour. So people that can't come uh, to the event can kind of live vicariously through the Storify. Again, I'm not creating anything for this. Um, I'm making a community story using everything that's being shared. Um, you can uh, add links in. So when I'm doing the jobs one, I'm pulling up these jobs links and pulling them in and then writing the short descriptions. You can pull in Instagram pictures, um, uh, Facebook if a uh, post is uh, marked as public and hashtag, you can use that. I mostly use uh, Instagram and Twitter because that tends to be kind of the most uh, dynamic and fun content. Um, but it's also a great way to keep a record of an event that you had and all that was done. So if you're talking to a grant person or if you're trying to get sponsors for the next year and say, and they're like, well, I don't, what is this event about? You can send them a link to the Storify and you can see all these people that are involved and all the cool stuff that they did. Um, <coughs> And it also um, permanently curates it within the story. So you'll see a lot of news organizations using it, uh, again, around the political stuff, because sometimes tweets are posted and then deleted. Um, it's a way for them to see it, drag it in, and then keep it as part of the historical record. So free, simple, uh, a fun way to kind of use social media without having to worry about being the content generator. Yep. Yeah, you can only see uh, related items that are public. Like if someone has a private Instagram account, you won't be able to see theirs. But if somebody's not on Twitter or Instagram, um, and isn't checking those feeds, when you share the Storify, it um, sends them to this published story page where they can just scan through and see everything. And if they are on social media, it's really easy. If they see someone that's um, doing really cool stuff they're not following, they can actually click and follow them right there. So it also helps generate more social. Um, so I, I've been using it for years and absolutely love it. We've used it for several different things, um, but particularly kind of events and then anything we want to, uh, to carry and kind of share later. Do, do, do. And then the, I just have two other short things real quick. Um, I mentioned uh, TweetDeck earlier. Um, 
There are dev several different ways if you are um, using a lot of different social accounts or managing several accounts or wanting to keep your eyes on several hashtags. Um, there are several different ways to uh, kind of tame your social feeds using um, some feed managers. <laughs> I use TweetDeck. Um, it's another free tool that you download. Um, it allows me to keep track of all the different accounts that I manage right now. Um, and I can set up search columns within here. So around Coast Day, I set up one for DE Coast Day so I can see what people are posting. And I've got everything right in one place rather than switching between accounts. Um, and it's really easy for me to quote tweets within here, like tweets, respond to them. Um, it just adds some uh, sanity to the madness um, when, you're, when you're juggling a lot of different accounts. And you can uh, play videos right within here as well. There's some others. Uh, some institutions use Hootsuite, uh, which has a free version, but I think the paid one is much better. Um, this one called Sprout Social. There's a couple of different uh, ways of doing it, but um, I've used TweetDeck for a long time. It's simple. It's worked for me. Um, it doesn't go down very often. And I can also, um, I don't schedule tweets a lot. Um, just by scheduling tweets, I mean planning ahead and saying I want this to go out at 3 o'clock today. Um, mostly because you never know what's going to happen that might be related to the content that you're putting out. Um, there's been several very public examples of scheduled tweets going out that are um, not appropriate. Like a radio station did a bunch uh, promoting a concert, and the concert stage collapsed, and there were a bunch of depth, uh, deaths. And uh, whoever was running, running it didn't think about turning off all the scheduled tweets, and all of a sudden there's all these fun, you know, uh, totally oblivious tweets going out from the radio station. Um, and I've, I've been surprised by some news events that have been related to stuff that I was planning to put out that the would seem insensitive. So if, if I know I'm not going to be able to be at the desk all day, I might schedule some very innocuo innocuous things that aren't going to ruffle any feathers. Um, but there are a few people on some of these accounts that also um, support me. And if I know I'm going to be gone, they'll keep an eye on the feeds. And in TweetDeck, when I schedule tweets, on their tweet decks, they can see what I've scheduled as well. And they can really um, go in and delete or change something if it needs to be done quickly. Um, so they can see what I'm doing on what I have planned on my side. So that's another reason I like tweet deck. And one last thing, I just wanted to mention infographics because that's another uh, great visual way to tell a story or um, share a, a lot of information in a very visually effective way. Um, our National Aquarium in Baltimore does a beautiful job. They put out um, infographics on all sorts of things. Uh, for Valentine's Day, they did one called w Will You Be My Valentine with all these fun facts um, that are adorable. It's beautiful and it's very shareable because you know people love to kind of wow their friends with these types of fun facts. Um, like an octopus has three hearts. So. Um, they're pretty simple to do. This is one we did uh, that went out along with a press release related to a huge study we had coming out in a few journals about climate change and sea level rise in our region. Um, we pulled it together, pulling some of the really important numbers that people might really care about, and uh, sent it out with the press releases because, again, our local papers are short-staffed. They don't have the art departments that they used to. And by having that press release with this bright, beautiful graphic that breaks it down for people, um, this ran in a lot of the papers as is because it helped them fill a hole um, and it supported the, the news story as well. And I have... Um, Pictochart.com is just one example. I think I've got two other links in the resource document. Free, easy to use, so easy to use. They give you full templates to make one of these infographics. 
They give you all the cool little graphics you can search for. You drag, you drop, you put your own text in, and you've got a beautiful share, shareable infographic. You used to need, need an art director and a graphic designer, someone that knew Adobe Illustrator and how to put it all together. Um, but there's another one that's called Canva, Canvas, what about the S? Um, is another beautiful, easy way to um, pull one of these together on your own without having that um, very specialized uh, skill set. So those are all in there too. Um, and it's, it's just another interesting way on, on social media to really tell a story within, within one file, one graphic, um, in an engaging way that's a little different and will stand out in the feed. So I know I've gone through a lot of information. It's, uh, I'm just trying to cover all the basics across the board to give you guys ideas to kind of build and work <laughs> off of. So um, if there's any questions at all, I, I know we're going into a coffee break now. We're almost 15 minutes late. So I'll let you break for coffee, and I can answer questions in the meantime. The metrics on Twitter, what do you use? Because Twitter's own metrics are not as good as Facebook's, for example. Um, they've gotten better when you go to analytics.twitter.com. I keep an eye on, on that page because it's really good for weekly and monthly. But um, if you look in the top right, you can download spreadsheets with all, all the information. So um, for all of my accounts, I do monthly reports. So at the end of each month, I pull the data and I kind of organize it. So when you download those spreadsheets, uh, you can organize it into highest engagement, uh, you know, highest likes, highest shares, and then I usually like pull top tens out of there to just get an idea of, of what's really working and, and what's not. So the, they, they give you kind of the really pretty, e easily digestible version when you go to the analytics, but they've got kind of the hardcore numbers in there too. Um, I, it's just a button, I think it says like export as CSV or that you can open with a spreadsheet. All right. 